So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker, Alan Cobb. He is a master gardener with us, but also a local landscaper. Um, Alan is very talented and knows a lot about plants. Um, Laura and I are both inspired by him and his just drive in all, what he does. So he's a great resource this evening for questions. Um, and I won't stop him from even giving a further introduction for himself. So let me just stop sharing. And Alan, you are welcome to take it away. All right. Thanks, Joanna. That was a great introduction. And that really, um, that was more than, more than necessary, but um, I, I really feel privileged to be uh, part of the group in Athens. It's, um, it's been a great experience for the last several years, um, just being involved in some of these projects around town and, and uh, working with so many people who are very passionate about plants. And, and um, I, this is a, a derivative of a uh, talk I gave last year about native stuff. So that is really my passion and how I got into landscaping to begin with. Um, so there's going to be, a, I'm going to touch on a lot of native stuff tonight, but, um, I'm not a purist, you know, we can definitely discuss any, um, sorry, I'm having some trouble with this, but any, we can also, we can discuss any plants that you guys are interested in for sure. So. Sorry, I'm having a hard time with this. There we go. It always happens at the inconvenient times. <laughs> well, and my uh, keyboard for my uh, tablet is not working either. So everything has to be on touch. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, it looks good. So you're All good. right. I think we're good to go. So um, landscaping under canopy. Um, I'm going to touch on some kind of um, unique features or aspects of woodland gardens or woodland landscapes um you know everyone's familiar with the azaleas and camellias and linton rose and and uh leary oak and and the common things but i'm, I'm going to touch on some uh kind of more obscure things you probably haven't come across before um just trying to introduce some some different things but um feel free to interrupt me throughout the uh, uh presentation because we are going to kind of jump around to a lot of different topics so if you have a, a question that's pertinent to what we're discussing in the moment let's uh we can stop and um and discuss that. That being said, I'm going to kind of fly through these slides too, because we have about 55 slides to go through a lot of pictures I want to get to. So, um, but I, I want to make time for the questions more importantly. So we'll just get started. Um, you know, this is just one I came across. I thought was a great example of what people have in mind for like woodland gardens. Um, you know, here's another example here and it's just, it's really lush. It's really full. And I think that's what people expect um, for a forest environment. Um, it's all about the diversity and the competition. So you see how how tightly everything's planted and how how close um, everything is grouped together. So some of the opportunities in woodland landscaping that I'm going to discuss tonight are um, the the seasonal interest that you can get, and especially using natives. Um, a lot of the ornamental stuff that's bred for consistency. Um, doesn't always give you that seasonal color. Now, some of the cultivars and some of the ornamental things are, you know, introduced because of the seasonal interest, but um, that's one opportunity you get with woodland landscaping. Um, bringing nature close to home, creating habitat is really one of the best benefits of landscaping in the woods, I believe. Um, and then you get rare species uh, that are, you know, unique to these ecosystems. And sometimes you get, uh, you know, indigenous medicines um, and, and food like pawpaw and persimmon. And we'll discuss those later. Um, biggest thing, um, and these, these next couple of slides are pretty dense, so I'll fly through them, but you really just have, um, need to understand the ecosystem you're working with. Um, when you're planting under trees that have been there already, you know, you're not going to be able to plant, um, a mature forest. That's, you know, you're really got to work with what's already there. So it's really important. The first step is to kind of take inventory of what you're working with. So you have your upper canopy, your mid story, and then your ground covers. Um, so the upper canopy, you know, 20 to 30 feet, that's what's already there. You know, there's um, either deciduous or evergreens or a, a, a mix generally in our area. Um, so this is really the foundation for the ecosystem that you're going to build. And just a, some example of some of the deciduous hardwoods. Um, these are all the natives, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see how important the trees are as a keystone for the ecosystem. Um, evergreen trees is, um, don't provide the fall color, but it gives you kind of the consistent look throughout the year. 
Um, so your mid story is going to be kind of what we're going to be planting. You know, that that's where we would start with what we're going to introduce. So some smaller trees like dogwoods or red buds are really popular. Um, and then you also have a lot of deciduous, uh, shrubs like, uh, the native azaleas, hydrangeas, um, and then all the evergreen stuff that people are really familiar with are, are, um, evergreen, um, Asian rhododendrons and our camellias and, uh, and things like that. So this is really the, where we're going to start with the landscaping. And then the understory species are going to go with the midstory. So you're going to kind of gr group things together into um, different um, uh, combinations, basically. So these are a uh, couple different varieties of our native azaleas. It's one of my favorite plants. Um, it, it, they are deciduous, so they do drop their leaves in the winter, but um, you get some really spectacular flowering in the fall, in the early spring. Um, so the ground covers um, can be anything from stuff that really holds the ground to things like ferns and some grasses that, you know, give you about two feet height. So technically anything less than six feet tall is a ground cover. So there are even some shrubs that would fit in that category, like um, cephalotaxis plum use or one that I would, uh, we're going to talk about later as a replacement for like a juniper, for example. Um, so there's lots of different, um, options for gr the ground covered layer. Uh, this is one that I really like. It's a uh, Chrysogonum. It's a native, um, but this one will create a really nice carpet. And what's important about using a lot of ground covers is they will help to suppress any weeds that might want to come through. Because if you have a uh, negative space, it's really going to be conducive to growing weeds. Uh, and, and the more coverage you have with what the plants you want, the more you can choke out the plants you don't. Um, here's a combination I have in my yard that I really like. It's um, Pieris, uh, Pieris japonica, the Japanese Pieris. And the ground cover there on the front hanging over the rocks there is uh, Michelle ripens. It's a uh, partridge berry. It's one of my favorite natives. I really want to start trying to grow this into, um, into flats and sheets that we can you know, start using in landscaping. Um, I've had some pretty good success growing it so far. But, and then you see the irises mixed in is another uh, Japanese iris, iris japonica. Um, that plant will spread like crazy. It sends out runners and um, will quickly, quickly take over space. But, you know, that's really helpful if you're trying to fill large areas and you want to suppress weeds and, you know, then you put something down that grows very quickly. And it has a really cool flower resembling, uh, resembles our native dwarf crested iris. Here's a close up of the Michelle uh, ripens flowers, the partridge, partridge berry flowers. So you see that they come in pairs, but um, when it's pollinated, it only produces one berry, which is just kind of a unique uh, oddity in the plant world. You have two flowers for one berry, but they're really, they're really small and fuzzy and they actually have a great scent uh, that, that you can use, you can pick up on at night. It um, has an, a nighttime scent. So I imagine it's pollinated by uh, moths. Um, so here's an example of like a forest floor community. Uh, this was a picture taken up in the mountains um, near the Tuga River. So you see uh, at, the, at the bottom of the screen is the um, is some wild ginger, some uh, little brown jugs is a common name, um, hexastasis. And then you have partridge berry kind of growing all throughout. And then some ferns popping through. And then you have the shrub layer of um, what I believe is um, Itea in this picture. So that's, this is like a completely natural setting. And then you can see like, this is my planted yard here. So I'm trying to really emulate that community with the, the combination of all the different plants. And even through the partridge berry and kind of the forefront, you can't really tell with the photo, but there's some uh, wild orchids in there. There's um, some other little herbaceous uh, plants that are kind of mixed in. So really keep in mind, you know, when you're planting in the woods, um, it should look more natural. Um, and uh, that's not to say you can't have a more organized uh, landscape, but, um, you know, if you're trying to go with like the English garden boxwood perennial look, um, you're going to really struggle in the shade because all those plants really require full, full sun to thrive. Um, so here's one that I actually finished up today, um, but this is uh, under a huge water oak. So they had a hillside full of juniper. That was the that's what they had planted and it was completely choked out. Um, completely smothered by the leaf, the leaf litter. 
and um, just really looked looked terrible. So this is what we updated it with. And these are all, you know, I have more of the um, Irish Japonica in there. There's um, soft crest Mahonia. There's uh, some um, spreading U, uh, Cephalotaxis prostrata. Um, and then we have um, some carex grasses kind of up towards the, the front of the house along the sidewalk that'll really fill in well. And then the back you can't really see, but is um, Chasmanthium river oats, which is another really good shade grass that likes to grow on edges. So these combinations will really fill in. And um, in just a few years, you, you really won't see much negative space left. Um, so we'll start to touch on like the seasonal gardening. Um, and right now everyone I'm sure is noticing the leaf, leaf color and it's really been spectacular the last few weeks. So you're really selecting plants that will change throughout the year and give you that four season look. Um, hydrangea quercifolia is one that I talk about all the time. Um, the only the only issue with that plant is that the deer absolutely love it as well. Um, but you know it gives you really great fall color. I even think the bark kind of has some peeling bark. So once the leaves are off in the winter time, you get some interesting structure. And then it gets uh, some great um, uh, spring and fall blooms with some of the cultivars. They'll bloom twice. Um, and then we talked about the native azaleas and then vacciniums, you know, the, the different blueberry varieties. I really uh, I love for seasonal gardens, um, but there's a, there's so many other great plants. Um, Chinese pistache tree I've seen lately is just looking amazing right now. Super. I mean, one of the brightest red fall colors I've, I think you can come across. Um, you know, so that's one that I would say is if you have a spot for a tree. Um Service berry is another good one. Um, I would say uh, Nysa sylvatica, um, black gum, the gum trees, those are really nice as well. So there's so many options out there. Um, here's uh, two different native um, dogwoods that we have that are more of a shrub. So you can see the red twig dogwood. Um, it's a really interesting plant. And then I want to talk about some other kind of weird oddities of nature that um, is really unique to our temperate deciduous forests. So we get uh, some in early, early spring, we have a group of plants that are known as spring ephemerals. And basically they have adapted to growing in these temperate environments underneath um, deciduous trees. And they will, they will emerge and flower before the trees above the canopy above leaves out. So they're taking advantage of that very early very cool uh, spring sunlight. And then they're, then they're underneath the canopy when the heat of the summer hits. So they typically, the foliage will typically fade out, um, you know, mid summer and they'll disappear entirely. Um, you know, by, by August, September, you really don't see any sign of the plant at all, but it'll reemerge in early spring and grow quickly and quickly flower. And so these are some of my favorite plants. These were, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, um, exploring the woods around my house. I was always looking for these as, as like treasures in a way. Um, so we got a few pictures here and they're, and they're tiny little plants that are so easy to, to walk over and, 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 you know, these would be difficult to really garden with and landscape with, but I do want to, you know, people who are into like the fairy gardens or, um, you know, rock gardens in the gar in, in woodland areas, um, these can be some really interesting plants you can make small vignettes with. Um, Trillium, I think, is one that people are really uh, really uh, familiar with. And you can see here, these are just emerging. You can see the on the right, the, the leaf is just now poking through. Um, these are probably probably get to be about um, 18 inches tall before the end of the uh, spring, but they're just emerging. Here's a dwarf trillium that stays really small. This is out of the uh, botanical garden. Um, it's the only place I've ever seen that plant, but it's a really interesting one. And this is a bloodroot. This is one of my favorite plants. Um, and so this photo was taken two hours apart and you can see how quickly the flowers open, you know, and, and really even the leaves, a lot of the leaves are, are turned in um, when the sun rises and then they open and unfurl as the sun hits them throughout the day. So it just shows you how, how dynamic these plants really are. And then uh, here's a photo from my backyard where uh, we're in my little bloodroot patch. And you can see how ragged the leaves are looking. And this is probably like mid-June. So, you know, by the end of July, um, you really have very little, um, um, very little leaf left. Like you don't even know that they're there. 
Um, then there's also a group of summer ephemerals. So there's a, um, a, it's a smaller group, but they're almost an opposite. So they will flower in midsummer with no leaves present whatsoever. And then the leaves come out pretty soon after the flowering. So a lot of our native orchids do this. Um, Tupularia uh, cranefly orchid is one that I'm going to uh, show you in a minute. But ladies' tresses do that as well. Um, and then there's also uh, like chorus radiata is something that I'm sure people have been noticing last about a month ago. But the the surprise lily, the pop up um, or Johnny jump ups, I think sometimes people call them. Um, but uh, it's a Japanese spider lily. It's a bright red, uh, really beautiful flower, and it will emerge and then. Um, the flower persists for a few weeks and then dies back. And then you get uh, foliage that really resembles uh, Liriope um, that comes in and, and persists throughout the winter. So the foliage will die back in the summer and then it'll flower. So it's the flowering is delayed. That's the, really the difference between the summers and the uh, spring ephemerals. So here's a hardy cyclamen. Uh, and you can see to the very left of the uh, picture, you can see, kind of see some coils in the, in the, under the leaf litter. Those are the flowers, the next flowers about to emerge. And you can see the leaves just starting to pop up as the flowering is occurring. Um, so this is just a really interesting plant. Here's the uh, Tipularia discolor. Discolor, the Latin name uh, comes from the fact that it has two colors. So you see on the underside of the leaf uh, on the top right um, is bright purple. So that's one of the really distinguishing characteristics of this plant and it's nothing but that single leaf that's all you will see i mean they grow in clumps but the, the each individual plant is just a single leaf and you can see kind of in the middle of the picture that uh what looks like a stalk of straw that is the old seed pod after the flowering so and then here's the uh lycoris radiata not a, not a great picture but <laughs> i'm sure you people have seen everyone's seen this around lately um so i guess we're back to this one that's my mistake. Um, but this is a really, really common plant. I'm sure you guys will start to recognize this um, as you walk through the woods. Um, so another, hey, Alan. yes, real quick on the topic of spider lilies. Yes. Um, Bob asks, are there ways to encourage spread and growth in spider lilies? Um, I will say like, if you have an old clump, you could uh, divide them just like you would um, uh, irises. Um, so anytime you divide clumps of, of plants is it's generally stimulative um they they spread pretty quickly though i mean i i don't know that you you really need to encourage them to spread too much um but i i you know you get a nice clump and you can dig them and separate the bulbs and then those those will create larger clumps faster um so i think that's that's probably the best recommendation um but but i wouldn't i wouldn't I wouldn't be in a hurry to, to separate bulbs or, or separate clumps. Um, you know, if I would wait till you have a pretty substantial clump about, you know, several feet wide, but like I said, they will spread on their own fairly quickly. And this is the, the Japanese spider lily is coming from the bulb. I mean, uh, we do have a native spider lily that also has a bulb, but it's more of a wetland plant and it's a little bit more sensitive. So that one is not quite as aggressive. Um, the, the Lycoris is, uh, it's pretty aggressive. Um, so we can just touch on this quickly. Um, just some of the edible, uh, plants that I really like, um, are pawpaw and American persimmon. They're both great for wildlife, but they're also really good fruit for humans as well. Uh, persimmon, you have to really let it get super ripe. Otherwise it's very astringent. And then once it's super ripe, it's really only the consistency is only really good for like a jam, but it's really delicious. So if you haven't had American persimmon, I really encourage you to find one. And um, then some of the uh, medicinal plants I just wanted to touch on, bloodroot is, like I said, one of my favorites. It's got a sap that's very similar to iodine. So that's where it gets the name bloodroot. And um, it's a very astringent, uh, powerful uh, antiseptic. And then um, the camophila uh, maculate is spotted wintergreen. This was known as uh, Pepsiwa to the Native Americans, but they used it, uh, they called it um, stonebreaker. So it was used for, to like help break down kidney stones or gallstones. So here's a patch of pawpaw. You can see um, how quickly they will spread. And um, it's, you know, it's, it, I would consider these a ground cover. This is a dwarf pawpaw. So it doesn't get more than three feet off the ground. And you can really see how it does kind of create a nice uh, blanket. And then here's the spotted wintergreen. So this is just a tiny little plant that's, you know, just a few inches tall. 
And you can see right in the forefront, the uh, partridge berry growing in. So you can see how small these plants really are. But I think it's, um, it's a very interesting plant. And you, it's one of those that once you notice it, you start to see it everywhere. So uh, really how I got into landscaping was for wildlife. And everyone, everyone loves bluebirds. This is a, just a, a beautiful native bird we have. And so I think one of the bigger opportunities for woodland gardens is you're really creating habitat. And you can really help improve your ecosystem. And so here's a few notes on um, planting for wildlife habitat. Um, you know, obviously our human interference has an impact on wildlife behavior. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. If you really are striving for bringing wildlife closer to you, then you should consider, you know, where your pool deck is, where your party, you know, where your uh, fire pit may be, you know, things like that. So um, and then also supplemental feeders go a long way, but make sure you keep it clean. Uh, so here's some other creatures that I, that are near and dear to my heart that um, really how I got into landscaping to begin with was from herpetology and building uh, terrariums. And so, um, you know, this is, they're really important for the ecosystem as well. And it all comes back to the um, food chain. So, you know, we build we're planting plants that become the base of the food chain for the herbivores, but also for the pollinators. And then those insects become the food chain as well. So, you know, it starts with the plants, but then it just kind of trickles down from there. Um, let's see. So this is a uh, Calicarpa uh, beauty berry. And you can see about halfway down the stem, all the berries are gone. Um, and I've watched a mockingbird every day come here, you know, every, every 10 minutes or so come in and, you know, get a few berries and then fly away. And so after about uh, four days, he pretty much stripped this whole plant and it's a uh, very substantial size. It's about four feet by six feet. So um, it just shows you how quickly and how quickly they can, uh, you know, animals can take the food, but um, it shows you how important it is because clearly, you know, that was a, a, a prominent food source. So touching on pollinator gardens, um, hey, you know, Yes. Sorry, I want to interrupt you before no you got into that. Uh, we had one question kind of regarding water features. Okay. Sherry asks, do they encourage deer to come? Uh, yes. I mean, so when you talk about building wildlife habitat, you know, it's if you build it, they will come, right? So you're going to get everything. You're going to get, I mean, I even had, I had a groundhog in my backyard for two years before I realized it. Uh, be simply because I didn't cut uh, part of my grass in one corner and just let it grow up. And when I finally got around to cutting it, um, a groundhog had been living there for probably the whole time I'd been there. So um, when you do create habitat, uh, you will attract them. Now, that being said, um, water features for birds can look very different than something a deer would be attracted to. So, you know, if you do have a pond, or a stream, if you're recreating like a stream, um, that, that might attract deer. But if you just have a simple like water, um, uh, water fountain for birds, um, I don't think that's going to necessarily attract deer. And in fact, the sound might deter the deer, to be honest. So there, you know, deer individuals, they do learn. Um, I've, I've had a family in my backyard for the last four years that I've, um, I struggle with, but you know, they're, they're part of the ecosystem as well. So, I will say the biggest uh, deterrent is harassment. Um, if you have deer coming to your yard and you can go outside and run them off, you know, that's honestly the best way to, um, to deter them. There are some um, other uh, treatments you can use. Now the, the scents and things like that will quickly wash away, but there is one um, product called Milorganite. It's sold as a lawn fertilizer and it does work pretty well. I mean, it persists um, in the soil for, you know, more, you know, a week or so. So more than just a couple of days. And, um, that has been the one product that has been proven with research to actually be effective. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's a lot of trial and error and, um, noises and, um, hanging white, white flags and, and, uh, white plastic bags, things like that are definitely helpful. But you got to you got to change it up. Whatever you're doing, you got to do it. You got to change things up from time to time because they will learn and become accustomed to whatever you're doing. So um, any any other questions before we move on? 
we're good right now. Cool. So how are we doing on time, by the way? Are we about halfway through? You've still got about an hour, but oh, okay, that's cool. including questions if you wanted right. to go. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well then, so in Woodland setting, we're talking about less than six hours a day. So you, you're not really going to get the same blooming from your typical uh, pollinator plants you'd see in like a wildflower meadow. Um, so some of the plants I've had really good success with are pinstemons and um, the uh, chrysogonum, like I mentioned before. Um, and the chrysogonum blooms really early. So that's, um, and the, the spring ephemerals are really important for kind of providing that early nectar source for some of the first insects that emerge. And then carex grasses. Carex is a really important um, foundation for a lot of these pollinator gardens because it's the host plant for many uh, moth species. So having the um, food larval hosts or the, the food for the larval stages is really important as well. And then it's also important to include some foundation shrubs nearby which you're going to have naturally, I would imagine, in this woodland setting. But if you're starting with a pretty blank slate, um, you want to make sure that you are surrounding your pollinator garden with some shrubs for shelter. And then there are some particular shrubs that are hosts as well. So like Lindera, uh, Spicebush, Swallowtail host, and um, Magnolias, and some of uh, there's there's uh, Rhododendron is a host for several moths and butterfly species. So, um, and virtually all of our hard, uh, hardwood trees are hosts to many different species. So here's a couple of photos you can see in the left. Um, this is a camellia and you just see the, um, it's an uh, a sleepy orange butterfly that's uh, sleeping underneath the camellia leaf. And then on the right-hand side, you can see in the edge of that leaf that's been cut, it's been eaten away. You see the, um, it's a, a prominent caterpillar. So this is um, just kind of hanging out on that dead leaf edge and, and very camouflaged, very blends in very well. So this is a uh, long wing heliconia butterfly. And it is uh, the host plant for this is um, passiflora. So the passion flower vine. And we have, two different natives. We have uh, Passiflora incarnata. Um, this photo is Passiflora uh, lutea. So it's the, it's a very, very small flower. And um, lutea tends to be the host because it grows better in the shade. So Passiflora is also a host to uh, fritillary butterflies. But if the plant's growing in the sun, it's going to attract fritillaries. If it's growing in the shade, it's more likely to attract the um, heliconias. Um, and then hummingbirds, everyone, I, I think everyone tries to attract hummingbirds. I, I think they're really interesting, very, provide a lot of character. Um, so you have basically tubular and reddish tones attract hummingbirds most, most often, but it's really the tubular flowers that are um, really what you really should look for. Uh, so Lonicera, um, the different honeysuckles, uh, Lobelia cardinalis is a great native that I really, appre really appreciate and have a photo coming up. Um, and then uh, Budlea lindliana is the weeping butterfly bush. It, it does particularly well in the shade, whereas other Budleas really need full sun to thrive. Um, but it will quickly spread into a very large colony. So that's something that if you have space, um, especially on the edge for a screen, um, the Budleia lindleon is a good choice. It's semi evergreen, so it won't drop all its leaves, but um, it just creates a pretty thick, big moundy shrub in, in just a year or two. Um, here's the Lonicera. Um, you can see that's, I mean, that's just made for hummingbirds. <laughs> And here's a cardinal flower with the um, with the actually spice bush swallowtail on it. Um, here's another one I see hummingbirds on a lot. Um, it's Iris fulva, a copper flag. And then this is just a great pollinator plant in general. This is um, um, Cerulea racemosa, tai tai plant. Um, you see this growing in kind of coastal plain um, drainage dish areas, kind of a little, little swampy, but with well-drained sandy soils. 
uh, but you can see just the the racemosas uh, indicative of just the, the racemes covered in flowers and uh, just a great pollinator plant. Um, so for other plants to attract some other bird species, um, viburnum is really great, has a lot of, uh, has, has great berries. Um, the roost species, the different sumacs are just, I, I, I see bluebirds all over the sumacs I have in my house. Uh, Vaccinium is always covered in birds. Uh, Sambucus as well. Um, and then some of the perennials, um, you know, a lot of these will not thrive in the woodland setting, but if you can use them on the edge, then they'll, the woodland setting is the habitat that protects the birds. And so it kind of gives them um, transitional zones. And uh, that's something I didn't touch on in the beginning, but um, with a woodland setting, you know, typically in your yard, you're going to have edge, edge habitat. And the edge habitat is your best opportunity for diversity um, because you're getting more sunlight there. And especially if it's early sun and gives you late shade, that's really an ideal setting for just about anything you want to plant. Um, here's a American goldfinch on uh, echinacea and they will um, quickly take all the seeds out from rudbeckia echinacea. Um, here's that same beautyberry plant and you can see a uh, uh, praying mantis actually hunting on the berries now. So waiting for something to come along and lay in on those berries. And here's that sumac I was talking about in my yard. Um, you know, it has it holds the berries at the top and, and I'll watch bluebirds come back, you know, over and over again and just pick the berries clean. And it has this great fall color. So we'll just uh, open up for questions at this point. And we can go back through and kind of uh, touch on some more, some more plants um, for, for different situations, if, if that's helpful. Um, yeah, I'm totally fine. If anybody wants to just unmute, if it's easier for you to ask the question like that, or if welcome, you're welcome to put it in the chat and I can read it to Alan or Alan, you can read it, but we'll give everybody a minute. Hey, Alan, this is Chris Hanna. Um, I had always been told that sumac is like an um, invasive plant. Am I confused? No, you're not. Um, it is it is invasive. Um, invasive in the in the sense that it's aggressive. Um, so I would say that if you do want to use sumac, make sure you have like a wilder area. I mean, this is this talk was like last year was for natives, so it's really about kind of creating the habitat. Um, I've got it along my driveway, so the driveway helps to kind of contain it on one side, but on the other side, it's been it runs ten feet. I mean it. You know, it, it really wants to send up new shoots all the time. So there are some cultivars out there. Um, Rus aromatica is um, fragrant sumac. There's a cultivar called Logro that stays about two to three feet tall and doesn't have nearly as aggressive habit. So if you wanted to keep one as, in more of a, a controlled landscape environment, that would be one to look for is the, um, the Rus uh, aromatica grow low. Um, there's also some cultivars of the staghorn sumac, uh, tiger's eye is one that I've seen that stays pretty small. I think there's, um, a nice planting at the state botanical garden in the, the roundabout before you get into the uh, visitor center. Um, there's a few planted there. And so they stay low and, and still give you the features. Um, so yes, uh, Chris, you're, you're absolutely right. They, they, they can be, um, very invasive. Alan, we've got one question. It says, um, they're in Athens. How do you keep pineapple sage from taking over? So uh, <laughs> black and blue salvia is probably the one that I would be most concerned about taking over. Uh, the pineapple sage, it, you know, it's semi-hardy. I mean, now we've had, you know, we're, we do have warmer weather every year. But, um, I mean, I know 20 years ago, pineapple sage would have been an annual. So it, it's really tough to, to um, you know, when you have a plant in a really good space or, you know, really well, well watered, good soil, it's hard to, to keep it tame. I'll just say that. Um, in general, 
if you keep things on the drier side, they're going to be less vigorous. And also, you know, uh, holding back fertilizer, you know, not using a lot of compost and not using extra fertilizers might help. Kara, did you have your hand raised? Yes. Um, you went through a lot of lovely uh, woodland plants, but a lot of them I knew from just my background that they needed like a lot of moist, moist, humusy soil. Um, I'm trying to uh, spread my native plants. I do primarily native plant gardening, but I would even use some nectar plants, perhaps that, you know, a pollinator gardening and birds and so forth. But I have uh, mostly, it's mostly clay. There's a thin layer of humus type moist soil on top, but it's, it's mostly the Georgia red clay. What can I put there? And, <laughs> well, and it's full, and it's full shade. Full, full shade. Yeah. I mean, that's my, that's my situation too. Um, and it's, you know, it's a holdover from the old cotton plantation, you know, cotton terracing. Um, you know, I, the first thing I did is I started bringing in wood chips. Yeah, I've been there about four years now. I mean, it really is important to try to build that layer back up. Honestly, um, that's going to be, I mean, regardless of what you plant, um, the health of the ecosystem starts with the soils. And so when you have those truly depleted soils, um, it's really um, it's really important to try to build them up as best you can. But that does take time. Um, I, some of the plants I've had the best success with, the carex grasses really do like dry shade. Um, and they tend to do really well as like a, a lyrio replacement. Um, and there's several different varieties that will do well in dry shade, like the um, Appalachian sedge. Um, there's a Pennsylvania sedge. Um, but there's also some sedges that require a lot of moisture, like you referred to. Um, then there's also um, things like uh, Chionanthus um, can handle kind of both environments. Um, you see them at dry, like a um, granite outcrops and things like that. So uh, the Grancy Graybeard, the fringe tree. You may see that um, in a dry situation do pretty well. Um, other thing, I mean, even like mountain laurel, um, you know, and edgeworthia, um, they, you know, they don't want to dry out, but they don't, they want to be in really well-drained soil as well. So with your, with your situation, it's just clay. I know that sounds, it's, it's contradictory, but um, it's really having a loose soil that's important, you know, and that's, that's where adding wood chips encourages the, um, the microorganisms to come in and start to kind of mine that, that really compacted hard soil and just the activity of the insects moving through the, the leaf litter is really important to help kind of, uh, recover that soil. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, Kara, it's it, when you have a really harsh, dry soil, there's, there's not a whole lot you can do. And I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're aware of that. Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry. I have planted a lot of the, the river oats around the yeah. border of my woods, and that is very, very happy. <laughs> so, Great. Yeah. I mean, I if, if people want some, in fact, I would love to share it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I may need to get with you. I'd love to. I love that plant. That's one that I try to put everywhere. Um, it does yeah. really great on on the uh, roadsides. Yes, I have it kind of everywhere because I started with a hundred seeds and I thought they weren't going to germinate, and I soaked them and <laughs> soaked them. And all of us, I mean, I actually had several hundred seeds because I gave a hundred seedlings away to a friend. <laughs> wow! Well, yeah. good for you. <laughs> and planted the other hundred. <laughs> wow! Yeah, that well, that's a great plant. Yeah. It's better than plant, it's better than Lirio. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All righty. We have a question from Beth. She asks, what grows under a large water oak tree? The soil is red clay and very yeah. compact. I yeah, think. this is such a common situation. And water oaks are notorious. I mean, be, you know, the, the name says it all they soak up so much water. And so in the middle of the summer, it's such a challenge because, you know, you can have plants that are well-established, but if, if you get into a really dry spot, that water oak will suck up all the water available. 
and I've seen it. I mean, I had trouble with some native azaleas planted under my water oaks. Um, and they were doing fine. They were well, they've been there two years. They were doing great. And before I noticed any problems, um, I lost three out of four. I mean, they were just, I mean, they just got dried out. Um, and it was the water oaks. I mean, I, I, I imagine it had to be the water oaks. Um, so I will say like, if you can build up the subsoil, you know, with, with mulch and wood chips, again, I think that's going to give you, um, your best advantage to like having a root zone that's a little bit further away from the tree, but the tree is just going to grow into it again. Yeah. So it's really just, it's, it's more of just, um, understanding that the further you can get out from under the roots of that tree, the better. Um, but it's, it's a challenge and it's just something to keep an eye on like plants that in the middle of a summer, if you know, you got a drought coming, I mean, it's just something that they're going to need some supplemental water mm -hmm. and maybe something like water bags where you can be more direct on the plant you're trying to maintain and not watering mm -hmm. the whole area, mm -hmm. um, drip lines and things like that, where you can be more direct with the watering. But, um, you know, over time, those, the roots of the trees are going to grow to where the water is too. So just something that it's a, it's a challenge. It really is. Unfortunately, um, water oaks are a weedier oak, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And so I also have dogs in the yard, which doesn't help either right. in terms of compacting the soil. Um, but you're saying that it is okay to go ahead and just fill that area that, I mean, it doesn't grow anything um, to just put um, wood chips there and, and mulch. I, I did hear that I should not cover the roots of the tree. So maybe just like an inch of mulch is all I should do. What's your thought there? Um, with, I mean, I think the roots that you're seeing, the exposed roots that you're seeing are, are typically very woody and hardened off. So you, all your feeder roots are on the very extreme edges of your root system. So more under the drip line of the tree. Okay. Um, and I think it's more about piling up mulch on the trunk of the tree is what, so you don't want to, you don't want to encourage rot near the trunk. I think uh. that's, that's the bigger uh, um, concern with okay. mulching around trees is that you end up burying that um, the trunk right at the base. And then that, uh, that's um, that fosters diseases like Phytophthora and other um, funguses and things like that, that, then set in afterwards. So, um, and then using, you don't want to use soil. You don't want to pile up soil either because that's going to be a little bit more, a little denser and not uh, drain as well. So it's, it's just encouraging root rot basically. Okay. But I mean, that's why uh, um, if you're using wood chips, fresh chips, just make sure that goes on top and not get, doesn't get mixed into the soil because mm -hmm. the activity of the wood chips actually breaking down will deplete the nitrogen in the soil. Oh, okay. So if you're amending your soil with fresh wood chips, there's going to be a nitrogen depletion before, like a nitrogen suck is what happens as the uh, material breaks down. All the bacteria that breaks down the, the fresh material uses up all the available nitrogen and then it dies and re-releases it. So that's sort of the, con that's sort of the composting process is the breaking down of the material and then the subsequent breaking down of the organism organisms that broke down the material after they crashed from breaking down all the material. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I've been learning more and more lately that letting the leaves just sit there over winter is an important part of the winter landscape that le trees don't drop their leaves like, oh, we don't want these leaves. They drop their oh, yeah. leaves because it provides them with their very own winter blanket. Absolutely. And they're, and they're also replenishing the soil. Um, yeah. So the only thing to be aware of is if you do have diseases, like if you have some foliar blights and things like that, those spores will persist in the fallen leaves and persist in the soil thereafter. And then the subsequent seasons, you'll get the rain splashes those pathogens up to the, to the new growth. And then that's how the disease persists. So that's the only thing to keep in mind. If you do have um, disease issues, then, you know, you okay. do want to periodically remove those leaves. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. Kara. You're on mute still. Sorry.
the space bar unmute wasn't working, sorry. <laughs> um, on the subject of, of spreading the wood chips to create soil, is it helpful to um, top the wood chips with some high nitrogen fertilizer? Yes, it is, absolutely. Um, that's a very, but I would do that kind of to the side, like in, not in, in mixed in the planting, if that makes sense. So if you got the wood chips spread already in your plantings, I would just kind of let it go. But if you have like a pile of wood chips off to the side that you're trying to make into good soil, then yeah, I, I've done that before. It's, it's very effective, um, you know, buying like a bag of mushroom compost or some of the other, you know, already composted um, and then dumping that on top. It definitely helps. Thanks. No problem. We've got a question from Vicki. She asks, would you start with small trees or ground plants to get started in a fairly dry woodland habitat on a hill? Yes, I mean, especially being on a hill. Um, I think you want to be concerned about uh, erosion. And like we've been saying, it's so important to try to build that soil back up. And you really can't build that soil back up without having some roots in the ground to kind of kind of mine the soil also. So if you and you, you know, I'm assuming you've got some established tree canopy already. So you can definitely start with just smaller understory stuff. And then, you know, as you as that stuff becomes established and you see some gaps you want to fill, um, you can definitely fill in with some um, understory trees and shrubs. But um, as far as planting trees in general, I would say that if you can if you can go with a smaller tree, you will almost always be better off because that smaller tree is going to rebound and take off more quickly than a larger tree. Uh, the larger tree is going to have a harder time adjusting to the transplant. And so um, if you can, uh, planting a smaller seedling is usually a better, uh, gives you a better end result. This is just a random comment. I'm just enjoying listening to all this. And I have a lot of the same situations that y'all have. I have only water oaks in my new property. Oh, yeah. And um, <laughs> I've put a few uh, regular azaleas and a few natives. And some of them have struggled. And some of them maybe found like some more space between roots and have done okay. Right. And we have tons of wood chips mulching them just to help prevent dryness in the summer. But, but the comment was just that I've always liked red buds and so I've dug up a few volunteers from my parents house and stuck them in the ground and they've actually done quite well just sort of scattered around as an more of an understory tree but they're surprisingly hardy um and I, yeah I've always enjoyed red buds as sort of a native semi understory um wildlife tree absolutely yeah red buds one of my favorites as well and um and they can, they can be weedy. I mean, they are very vigorous. And um, I did the same thing. I transplanted, I, I did uh, three transplants in my front yard and um, two, two of them did not do so well. Uh, um, they were in competition with other trees, I think, but um, I didn't do anything to them. I just dug them up, stuck them in the ground. And uh, one of them's turned into a very, very nice tree. So yeah, it's, it's, it's nice when you can start to recognize these plants out in the wild because you know, when you see a seedling tree, it doesn't look like anything, but if you get in the right spot and take care of it, it can become a beautiful specimen. So that's something that, that's how I grew up was just going out and collecting treasures. <laughs> so what else? Vicki also asks, what small trees would you recommend to get started on the slope? Um, as far as like what will hold the soil so well. I mean, as far as trees go, I don't think there's anything you go wrong with. Um, now for like the understory kind of ground cover stuff, I would say um, cephalotaxis is a really good one. The spreading you is a really good one. Um, it's very, it resembles juniper. So it's the same way people will use juniper to, to kind of fill in the hillside, but it does really well in the shade. Um, so that's one I would recommend. I mean, honestly, like if you if it's a real problem, I mean, Leary Oak will work. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's um, it, such a tough plant and it will really hold that soil really well if you're having like serious erosion issues. Um, but as far as trees go, I mean, I think it's really just um, 
what you want to to look at. Honestly, I mean, I don't think there's anything um, wrong there. Um, there are some shrubs that are a little bit more aggressive at suckering, like itea or clethra or um, um, even like even the budlea, the budlea lindliana I mentioned before. Um, that can hold the hillside very quickly. So, um, you know, if there's, uh, if anybody has like very specific situations that they really need help with, I mean, I'm, uh, and they're, especially if they're in the Atlanta or Athens area, um, I'm happy to, 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 you know, try to set an appointment up and maybe come out and take a look. Cause it is, there's so many variables and it's so, there's so many choices and so many options with plants. Um, it's really, it's really difficult to say without really seeing the site. Alan, did you have your email? I don't know if I saw that. I think it's on the next slide. Okay. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> that is all the questions that I have in the chat. But if anybody else has any, please feel free. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been great. Awesome. You're welcome. Yeah, last year I like ran long, and this year I ran way short. So um, <laughs> I guess I need well, to practice more. I love it when what, there's time for questions. So yeah, I really want to make sure we can answer questions. So yeah. I, I don't think we got to do that last year. So so yeah. Kara, did Kara. you have something? Yeah, if, if if no one else has some questions, um, you show you showed some dwarf pawpaw in the woods, so that that will grow in the shade. Will that work in in my situation? Or it may. I mean, so the dwarf pawpaw in particular um, wants to be a little bit wetter. I mean, it was growing down mm. toward a river. Oh, okay. So, um, but I know the. Um, the larger pawpaw, the um, Asamina tree loba, um, it's, you know, it's also known for being kind of river bottoms, but I think it, it has a tendency to uh, get root rot in containers. So I imagine it can do a little bit better in a drier situation. Okay. Um, persimmon, I think you could get away with too. Like, I think I have some persimmons, really there's persimmons all over my property. And, you know, it's that very okay. similar dry, um, hard, harsh soil situation. But they would, would they, because I, ha I think I have one tree that I planted a number of years ago that I think is a persimmon and it's a nice, it's a, turning into a nice tree, but the other two that I was planting, one of them is barely alive and okay. the other one died. So I don't have any, you know, cross pollinators. Right. I imagine there's some nearby though. There, I mean, it's a pretty common plant. Um, I find it a lot in the woods around here. And, well, I'm a suburb, so... <laughs> Well, that's maybe not, but uh, um, I can share some seeds with you. We got, I got plenty. <laughs> oh, oh, that would be great. I would like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just shoot me an email. Uh, I'd love to, love to connect with you. We can trade. I'll trade you for uh, Chesmanthian. <laughs> oh, okay. Fabulous. Good deal. <laughs> Alan, what about something like a wax myrtle in some of the tougher spots? Yeah. Wax myrtle does okay. Um, it wants more sun. Yeah. Um, it'll be it'll be a little thin in the shade, but it'll grow. I mean, the same with like Yopon Holly. You know, Yopon will do okay in the shade, but it really prefers to be in in full sun. Um, so I mean, there's a, a, so many plants can can live in shade, but they're not going to perform and look the way you expect them to. So that's something that's you know I come across plants all the time in deep shade that like sometimes it's like what is that you scratch your head for a minute and then you look at it closer like oh wait it's uh you know it's a camellia that's just like completely starved and strung out you know so it's 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 interesting to see the shapes and forms that plants can take you know based on the environment they're in so um i, I just mean, thought I, of a question that's come up in real life multiple times um a lot of folks look for an alternative to almost specifically Nandina in the landscape, you know, right. whether they're newly moving into a house or, or trying to get rid of Nandina, maybe that was already landscaped into it. Are, are there any that you can think of that would sort of provide some shade screening, you know, in a backyard area or something like that? Yeah, I would say uh, viburnums 
are okay. a good choice. I mean, our native viburnums are deciduous, but yeah. some, of the, um, some of the Asian varieties are not. So you're not do as have, invasive. <laughs> um, are they're they're not deciduous. They're um, they're evergreen. So you know, it will give you the same look as the Nandina, and then yeah. still provide some uh, some berries. You know, some food for wildlife. Yeah, that's great. Um, so like uh, moodlet lace is uh, mm -hmm. a viburnum variety that I think is really, uh, really nice. It stays kind of low and moundy. Um, it has a little bit bigger footprint than the Nandina. I mean, Nandinas are nice because of their, you know, their, their tight footprint and, mm -hmm. and kind of bright growth and, and the textured leaves is, is really nice. But um, I will say uh, soft caress Mahonia. It's not mm -hmm. the grape leaf mahonia that everyone's familiar with uh, the organ gray poly that everyone's familiar with as being invasive the soft caress um it doesn't get as big as nandina but it kind of has the same kind of textured look and it wants to be in full sun also but it can handle being in the shade as well gotcha uh, so that's one that kind of looks similar um yeah so i'll say like between the two between viburnum and Oh. Yeah, those are great. A lot of times, usually it's just people maybe become aware of the issues with Nandina and they're like, right. okay, I'm committed to getting it removed, but we don't want just a bear. A lot of times, you know, Nandina is planted between people's yards and stuff. You know? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, to kind of give a little bit of a yeah, <laughs> demarcator. So, yeah, either the, some of those might work. Well, and I will say too that, like, from everything I've read about the problems with, you know, birds being poisoned, um, it, to me, and this is my, my personal opinion, but to me, it seems more like an issue with a lack of biodiversity. Hmm. Um, the fact that the birds have nothing else to eat and have to gorge on them is really what seems to cause the issues more than the fact. Because, I mean, I don't, I, Nandinas have been around a long time and yeah. it's clear they provide a, a food source. And I think the issues really come with um, the lack of other food sources. Frankly. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, do, so I, I say that to, to say, like, if you have Nandina, like, you don't need to run out and cut them out. Like, I, I think they're okay as long as you're aware that you need to provide other stuff. <laughs> you, you know, if you can have some diversity, it's, it's helpful. Like berry bearing plants. Yeah, like blueberries or vaccine or, you know, or um, uh, viburnums or... Mm -hmm. um, you know, even hollies and other hollies. Hollies. I've had the cedar yeah. wax wings invade my holly berries in the fall. Oh, yeah. Even though I even, do. even privet. I mean, even the ligustrum, you know, the Japanese ligustrum as well. I mean, I'm not recommending planting that. I'm just saying that there are, there's other food sources out there. I'm not, I'm not advocating planting privet. <laughs> Just to be clear. <laughs> but sumac is, I mean, I love, and I know we talked about how invasive it can be, but if you do have an area in your yard that you want to provide wildlife habitat and you can let it go wild, um, I do think the uh, staghorn sumac is a really spectacular plant. Will it do okay? Well, I have a, a big creek bed area that's all totally wild and I'm trying to reclaim it a little bit and that would be really pretty down there it, if I did it up the bank from that would it do okay there you think yeah I mean you're not going to get the fall color unless it gets like bright unless it gets good sun um, yeah. so it'll be oh nice. it's open yeah there's no trees yeah then I think that would do great there and it would really hold the bank as well hmm. I might need to find some sumac somewhere I got some for you <laughs> yeah really does like it I said, it, well? it does, it does send up runners. It's got, I got lots of little seedlings. Oh, I'll come cut some out of your yard. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, we, we definitely, there's, there's a lot, Laura, we need to talk. There's lots of plants you could come. Yeah. Get out if you have weedy patches of things that are getting too aggressive, just call oh, yeah. me over someday. Like, yeah, I'll just come with a bunch of pots. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. We need to do that. <laughs> Well, I do not see any more in the chat, but if anybody's got anything, thank you all for coming, by the way. This has been a fun night, lots of chatting. It's fun to have back and forth rather than feeling like you're talking to a screen. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. Yeah, I appreciate the questions. And, and uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, there's my email addresses there um, or shoot me a text, uh, whatever works for y'all. And uh, just happy to help. Awesome. Awesome. And I will have 
uh, the post-class email I'll send out. It may not be this week, maybe next week, but it will come your way and it'll have the link for the survey and it also have the notes and all of that. So definitely be on the lookout for that, everybody. And if you somehow got in here without registering and you like a friend shared the link with you and I don't have your email, if you don't mind just shooting me an email, which I will put in the chat so that you can get the post-class email, that would be great. But thank you, Alan, for your time tonight and for the great presentation and all of your knowledge. <laughs> Well, thank you, Joanne. I love this, and I'm, I'm just a privilege y'all asked me to come back. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Have Kara. a good night. All right. You Bye -bye. too.